Thank you. My name is Donna Parisi. I'm a partner at Sherman and Sterling, and we are absolutely delighted to be hosting this program this afternoon. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to Women, Work, and the Supreme Court. This program will discuss the remarkable career and tremendous influence of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and how the issue of gender equality remains a struggle for working women today. I'm delighted to welcome Deborah Epstein Henry, who's going to be our moderator this afternoon. She's an expert, consultant, and public speaker on women and the future of the legal profession. She's also the author of a number of books on the legal profession and a president of Flex Time Lawyers LLC, a consulting firm she founded in the late 1990s, and co-founder and managing director of Bliss Lawyers, a firm that employs high caliber lawyers to work on in-house and law firm engagements. Debbie's a frequent commentator on women in the profession in many media outlets, including the New York Times, NBC Nightly News, the Wall Street Journal, and NPR. This program is part of a quarterly law and reorder event series on timely issues that Debbie has directed since 2002. She will lead our discussion this afternoon, joined by two distinguished panelists that I have the pleasure to tell you a little bit about. First is Irene Carmone, an award-winning MSNBC reporter and co-author of Notorious RBG, The Life and Times of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. This book spent three months on the New York Times bestseller list at MSNBC. NBC, Arin reports on gender, politics, and the law, with a special emphasis on reproductive rights in the Supreme Court. She is also a visiting fellow in the Program for the Study of Reproductive Justice at Yale Law School. Our final panelist is Jillian Thomas, who will be joining us shortly. Jillian is a practicing attorney. She's a senior staff attorney with the American Civil Liberties Union Women's Rights Project, where she specializes in employment law. She had an emergency brief she had to file this morning. So she will be here. Uh, we expect her in, in, in just a few minutes, and she'll jump right in. Um, Jillian has litigated employment discrimination cases as a senior trial attorney with the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission's New York District Office and as a senior staff attorney with Legal Momentum, as well as with private firms in New York and Philadelphia. She is also the author of Because of Sex, One Law, Ten Cases, and Fifty Years That Changed American Women's Lives at Work, which was published earlier this year. And now, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Debbie and our distinguished panelists. Thank you. So thank you so much, Donna, for the generous welcome and introduction, and of course to Sherman and Sterling for hosting this wonderful event. I have proper thank yous that I will make to all the people who made this happen, and Anna Brown in particular, but I will come to that at the end. Um, in the meantime, as was mentioned by Donna, um, Jillian Thomas, who is a, is a good friend of mine, I don't know whether she'll continue to be a good friend of mine, but she is running really late, but she's going to get here, and I'm confident of that. So in the meantime, you have our distinguished guest, Erin Carmone, and we're in for a treat. So thank you for coming. Just a few preliminaries before we get into the interview. Um, for starters, um, we have members of the press in attendance, so we've asked them to not um, quote anybody without requesting uh, attribution, and so we don't want to chill the conversation, but just a heads up that the press is in attendance. Also, we're among lawyers, and I need to say that any comments that are made are attributed to the individual and not the organization, so forgive us on that. Um, we do have uh, an international webcast being recorded simultaneously, so we'll have a series of a time for question and answer at the end. Please just be sure to speak into the microphone for the benefit of our webcast participants. And along those lines, unfortunately, they're not going to be able to ask questions. We'll only take questions from the live audience, but we do want to encourage them to join the conversation on Twitter and our catchy Twitter um, handle is uh, hashtag Carmone Thomas Law Reorder. So because it's so memorable, I'll say it one more time. Hashtag <laughs> Carmone Thomas Law Reorder. So please join the conversation on Twitter. And with that, um, before I dig into my first question with Erin, I like to share a personal story. I always try to do that where I can. And it's such a treat for me to host such distinguished people like you, Erin, and when I can bring a personal element to it, it's that much more fun. So um, in reading the book and devouring the book, which I, I loved, um, what was so special to me was that in addition to just it being a great piece of work and being really entertaining and fun to read, we had this personal qu connection to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and that is that my father, my parents are here today, Stanley and Sylvia Epstein, my father was a classmate of RBG, uh, James Madison High School, 1950. Um, and so my dad has always told this family story about how he ran for president of the class and the way it worked at James Madison High School was you ran on a ticket. So he ran for president, then there was vice president and secretary and treasurer and you were all on that ticket together. RBG was on the opposing ticket. She was in fact running for treasurer because you know, 
a woman couldn't be running for president. So as my dad relays it, his ticket won, and he became president of James Madison High School. And there was always this family joke that she ended up going into the judiciary because she probably wouldn't have been as welcomed in the executive branch. <laughs> so, so there we are. And if you don't believe me on this, we also have another member of the class of 1950, Sandy Zivon and, and Madeline, dear friends of my parents as well. And uh, Sandy not only was a classmate, but I think you were in the Go-Getters Club with her. Is that right? Okay, so they're available for questions afterwards. Um, I, think, okay. I, I think she was the treasurer of the Go-Getters Club. And uh, we, when we published her yearbook photo, um, some people loved it so much that they changed their Twitter bio to treasurer of the Go-Getters Club. <laughs> <laughs> and what we didn't mention, page 25 of the book, is this funny mention in, in James Madison High School yearbook, <laughs> which is, you should relay it, Erin. Go ahead. Well, we discovered in going back to the James Madison class of 1950 yearbook that uh, there was a person in that class who was named future Supreme Court Justice. That was not Kiki Bader, as she was known then. It was one Joel Scheinbaum. So I was curious, you know, did Joel Scheinbaum become a, a lawyer or a judge? Well, he's still practicing dentistry on Long Island. <laughs> which is a very distinguished profession, but there was another member of the class, obviously, that did become a Supreme Court Justice, so I thought it was a funny moment to think about who could we imagine being a Supreme Court Justice in that particular year and how she really defied those expectations. Right, and, and Joel Scheinbaum, of course, was at my bat mitzvah and wedding, so he's <laughs> lovely, too, and I'm sure he'd be available for questions. Um, in any case, we are There's here still to discuss the time for him book. to take that ninth seat. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, okay, so let's dig in. Um, Tell us about the story of how this book evolved and, and how you, what, it, what the book is about, but also the story of how it came to be. It's a really interesting story. Well, first of all, I'm so happy to be here. Um, thank you guys all for coming, and thank you, Debbie, and, and to everybody who organized. Um, it's a treat. And so I am actually here representing both myself and my co-author, Shauna Knishnik, uh, who could not join us because she is clerking on the Third Circuit. And she's taken a little time off for the book, so she's kind of maxed out. Uh, but she sends her regards. It was Shauna who, in June 2013, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, the Supreme Court's most important decisions come down right about now, through the 4th of July. And in, these, in this pivotal moment when the justices ascend the bench and you're waiting to finally find out what happened, the Chief Justice will say, this justice has the majority opinion in X case. And then that justice will summarize the case from the bench. Much rarer is for a Supreme Court justice to dissent from the bench. Um, I love this New York Times review that said that, uh, of our book that said, that dissenting from the bench is like arguing with your spouse in front of the dinner guests. <laughs> it's, it's kind of publicly shaming people. And on this particular week, Justice Ginsburg, who had previously been known until very recently as a kind of conciliatory, quiet, moderate judge, she dissented from the bench three times in one week, thus breaking a record. And all three of those cases involved uh, remedies to racial discrimination. One was uh, there were two uh, civil rights cases, two Title VII cases, actually. Uh, one was an affirmative action case that's now back at the court. And the third and most pivotal one was Shelby County versus Holder, in which the protections against disenfranchisement of the Voting Rights Act were severely undermined. And Justice Ginsburg delivers this fierce dissent. We now know that she actually wears different collars depending on whether she's in the majority or the dissent. So I got to sit with her, this is not in the book, I got to sit with her and say, Justice Ginsburg, in this court sketch, are you indeed wearing your dissenting collar? <laughs> because she's a stickler for the facts, and I didn't want to say she was wearing her dissenting collar when that day she swapped it out. And so she fiercely called the court to account and said, that you know, the, the pivotal line that she used in her written opinion was uh, throwing away preclearance or doing away with preclearance when it has worked and is working to block racial discrimination is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. And with those simple and elegant words, for people who were really dismayed by the outcome 
of that case and other cases and the general direction of the court, Justice Ginsburg was like this beacon, this clarion. And for Shauna, who was a second year law student, it was the only kind of inspiring note of uplift in that week. And so she wanted to uh, create a tribute to this woman who she knew a little bit about from law school. She knew a little bit about her equal protection cases. But she also saw a friend of her post on Facebook, wow, Justice Ginsburg sure can write hashtag notorious RBG. And so she decided to take that, which is for folks who are not familiar, um, a tongue-in-cheek reference to the uh, noted 90s New York, actually Brooklyn-based rapper, uh, who was different from Justice Ginsburg in some very key attributes. Um, <laughs> She's maybe less than 100 pounds. I think he was about 400. Uh, she is now uh, 83, and he tragically was murdered in his 20s. Um, but she always says, at first she had to say, who is this notorious to her <laughs> clerks? Um, but now she says, well, we're both from Brooklyn. <laughs> Um, so in the beginning, it was just about this kind of joke, this contrast, uh, that when we, we think of swagger, we think of fierceness, we think of a very masculine kind of, oh, one is a man, one is a woman, one is black, one is white. Um, come on come in. Come on up, Jillian. <laughs> We're all ready for you. <laughs> Sorry. If anyone works in the MTA, I'd love to talk to you. <laughs> talk to the program. Yeah. I'm going to turn this on for you. We're actually only on the opening question with Irene, so we're going to come to you next, and she's just okay. midstream. Mid okay. Uh, so, with this joking but respectful tribute to Justice Ginsburg, the first words on the Tumblr were those words I just quoted from Shelby County. Uh, Shauna wanted to find some kind of optimism or some kind of moral honesty, and I think it really struck a chord, and there was something happening kind of Organically, the same week, uh, two young strategists in DC created You Can't Spell Truth Without Ruth. People were using her face and her life. Uh, the first meme I ever saw was one in the 2012 election. It said, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg did not, never miss, did not have cancer twice without missing a day on the bench so that you could stay home and watch Law and Order reruns and not vote. <laughs> and so, now there are, uh, you know, I'm sure people saw, there's a Ruth Bader Ginsburg praying mantis, uh, <laughs> nail art, um, needlepoint, multiple tattoos, which really stresses her out. <laughs> she, she, she actually came to me and said, Erin, um, you have to tell people to stop getting tattoos of my face. <laughs> it's going too far. She's still a Jewish grandmother. Um, and so uh, it, we decided that it was, Shauna and I decided myself with a background as a journalist and her as an author and the creator of this incredible meme that we would team up and actually tell the story because as much as there was this kind of symbolic excitement, the more we learned about her life and the more we learned about her contribution to equal rights for men and for women and her participation in this incredible movement for equality of her generation, the more we saw it, we thought we have to take this to the next level. We're going to tell the story of her life, put it in the context of uh, the time and how far we've come. And also, one reason that people are st so excited about her is because they still feel that there's so far left to go. So that's, that's why we wrote the book. Perfect. And it's a really nice segue to bring Jillian in. <laughs> so delighted to have you. And I shared uh, an opening story about uh, my connection to the um, Irin's book, and I want to do the same with my connection to you. So, so Jillian and I have been friends for almost 20 years, and I, we originally got connected because um, she was actually being recruited by my law firm in Philadelphia, and she was a year behind me at Yale, and although we didn't know each other, this supposed connection was going to build the bond to make sure that this unbelievable talent comes to our firm. So I was charged with recruiting her. We were successful in doing so. It was really wonderful. And shortly after, and I don't even know if you remember the story. We have not talked about this. Uh -uh. But um, shortly after you arrived at the firm, I got staffed on this major litigation, which was a big team of lawyers, I think maybe six. And it was led by one of the most senior partners at the firm who was on the management committee, et cetera. Really important client. And anyway, we took on this litigation. And we miraculously won the, uh, a summary judgment motion. And it was a huge victory for the client. And so 
a senior partner sent an email firm-wide celebrating the win and acknowledging all the members of the team. And there was only one person who was not mentioned in the team, and that was me. <laughs> Instead of me, Jillian was named. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. and, and it was one of these things that we sort of were like, oh, how classic, like junior, you know, woman lawyer, fair haired, like they can't keep us track, you know, keep track of us, like can't keep, keep us we straight kind of thing. Like. Yeah. And it just, then all of a sudden I was like, well, wait, Jillian's really smart. She's very articulate, she's funny, like this may be helpful for my career. <laughs> so I didn't really dispute it, but I did find it ironic when I read Jillian's phenomenal book that it's all about women's injustice in the workplace. And this was really the inception of our relationship. It's also so. funny because people would confuse Justice Ginsburg and Justice O'Connor. Right, 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 right. Even though they look nothing alike. Who look alike. nothing alike. And yeah. it just happened, even though Justice O'Connor retired in 2006. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it happens. Uh, yeah. Even at repeat, repeat players at the court. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so with that, Jillian, I want you to start by just sharing with us um, really what your book is about and why you wrote it and, and just a little context about the book. Absolutely. Well, thank you all again for, for coming. It's great to see such a great crowd and wonderful, Debbie, to be on, on stage with you after all this time. You did a great job on that case. You should have been <laughs> mentioned. Um, so I'm an employment lawyer um, and uh, have been for, for um, some time. And um, Title VII, for those of you who don't practice employment law, is Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And uh, most of us know about the Civil Rights Act's significance for African Americans in this country. It was the culmination of a lot of years of strategizing and protesting and uh, literally blood, sweat, and tears. But, um, and there are many sections to it which are called titles, um, and Title VII is the one that deals with employment. And the, um, uh, the, the provision prevents discrimination on the basis of race, national origin, color, and religion, but at the very last minute, sex was added, and it has served as the basis for um, the development of everything that we as women or, or men in this room as well think of as women's rights at work. Um, with a few, a few exceptions, there's the Equal Pay Act and a few other laws that apply to women, working women, but this is really the big kahuna when we think of sexual harassment, pregnancy discrimination, uh, you know, I didn't get the promotion because I'm a woman. This, it, it all derives from Title VII. And I realized about seven years ago when I was thinking about, I was at a women's organization at the time and we were thinking about the way to best commemorate the anniversary, 50th anniversary of uh, the 64 Civil Rights Act, which at that point was in the future, it was in 2014. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to bring all the women who brought the seminal cases interpreting Title VII, wouldn't it be great to celebrate them at an event? And then I started thinking a little bit more, and I had just written a law review article, which I really had about pregnancy discrimination, which I really had enjoyed. And I thought, you know, why don't I meet them myself and write about them? And the reason their stories are so significant, not just because they're very dramatic and they were very, very brave, um, but the reason their stories are so important is because, because sex was added uh, on the House floor at the last minute in, during debate on Title VII, there are no committee reports or um, previous versions of the amendment or, or other sources of legislative history that we look at to derive meaning. It was just these three simple words, discrimination because of sex. And so it was left to the courts, um, to a lesser extent to the, to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, but the, the courts are the ones who issued the binding precedent, um, to decide what that meant. And the world in which Title VII came into existence in 1964 was a world in which, you know, just three years earlier, the Supreme Court had said it should be optional for women to serve on juries. Um, and it was a very segregated workforce, and women held, uh, only about 30% of women worked, and a uh, little under half of, of mothers worked, and that was mostly, or disproportionately, women of color. Um, women held um, you know, low-paying jobs that were more kind of caretaking, secretary, nurse, teacher, um, and look where we are today. So um, I wanted to tell a story that kind of told how we got from there to here, and at the same time, give faces to these names that I cited kind of by rote every day in my work, the case names that I cited by rote. And that's really what the New York Times in their book review and, and countless others really have conveyed about Jillian's book is so much about 
how she brought these stories to life, and we're going to come back to those and give some examples of that. But I want to turn to Erin Erin again and um, and ask you really, you chronicle in the book both uh, RBG's experiences and and sort of um, her record as a lawyer and her contributions as a lawyer as well as as a, as a judge. And if you could share with us perhaps you know a very significant impact she made both as a lawyer and as a judge, some of the standouts that you highlight in the book. Sure, well, I think it's fitting that, that Jillian mentioned the jury case. Right? Part of the rationale for uh, le sort of lessening uh, women's jury contributions or undermining them in the law was that women are the center of family life and home, I think was the quote. Um, so the idea was that women, in, in constitutional law at that point, women had been treated as being on a pedestal. That was the presumption. Um, that, that you couldn't compare it to racial discrimination because uh, women had a special role and that was one that was elevated. And so the, the essential argument that RBG had to make when she became the co-founder of the ACLU Women's Rights Project, where, where Jillian works, uh, was to think about how to convince the justices that women were people and not special and not lesser. And in her mind, this argument about difference was just another way to say that women were inferior. And the way that she did that was very incremental and very deliberate, but it came down to this idea that as she herself had experienced, anything that would be perceived as a special favor to women would actually be used against them. So she herself had been a victim of pay discrimination, pregnancy discrimination. She had not gotten jobs because she was a mother. She had been paid less at Rutgers. She started at Rutgers the year before the Civil Rights Act. So they told her, we couldn't possibly pay you what we would pay a man, and your husband makes a good living. So she successfully brought a class action claim on behalf of the women at Rutgers uh, and got back pay. So I think she realized when she was being told, for your own good, you have to quit your job, or you have to be demoted even though you're only three months pregnant because you can't travel, she realized that there needed to be a sort of broader systemic understanding under the Constitution uh, that the gender stereotyping could not be an instrument of the law. And the way that she did that, I think, was very novel and very exciting and not an accident. And that was primarily, or the majority of the cases that she brought to the Supreme Court were on behalf of men. And they were men that wanted to take roles that defied stereotypes. Even now, they defied stereotypes. But in the 1970s, the justices had trouble believing that these men that she brought before the Supreme Court, in particular one whose wife had died in childbirth, and he could not get access to the same caregiver credit as a widow would have gotten, or a man who was taking care of his elderly mother. That was women's work. Women's work was to be in the private realm, and men's work was to be in the public realm. And so through a series of cases, she attacked that logic, in part by challenging the fundamental assumptions that the justices made about men and women. And I think it was both very threatening, and she did it so boldly yet subtly that she got them by the end of her time to go almost entirely the way that she wanted them to go. It was like she was leading them by the hand very gently. And uh, as a justice, I think she really would have hoped to be in the majority more often. And I think her greatest impact as a justice, apart from a few important cases, has been to play the role that I described, which is as a kind of uh, moral beacon and dissenter and obviously we're waiting to see in the next month, will we see that dissenting caller again? It's not the role that she, I think, anticipated for herself because she's fundamentally a consensus finder, but that's the role that she has had to play given the current constitution of the court. And just an interesting follow-up on that, um, when you relayed both those aspects of her as a lawyer as well as a judge, um, it reminds me of a quote you have in the book which, which you take from her which says, generally change in our society is incremental, I think. Real change, enduring change, happens one step at a time. And that's something I think you conveyed really effectively in the storytelling in the book of both a very deliberate nature that she had, but a patience. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that's been part of her significant effectiveness. I don't know if that's something really that was a focal point in your conversations with her. I think it was something that actually was paradoxical because she did have bold aims. 
I think she still does. I think she has an, a, you know, a, a pretty radical transformative idea of what gender equality would look like. But she's deeply concerned about backlash. And I think she realized, partly of her being, being who she is, she was a soft-spoken, mild-mannered, married, white woman who was well-educated and extremely brilliant, that she could be the effective deliverer of a message uh, in the right way, as she saw it, that ultimately would help change the world alongside uh, legislation like Title VII. Um, so I think it, it's something that's hard to relate to in the sense of, while well, people think notorious RBG, it means she's gonna burn the house down, you know, and, and, and come in and like slam her fist down on the table in the Supreme Court and say like, women are people. Uh, but that's not how she did it. And I think that the lawyers in the room, which I think almost everybody is, will understand that the law is about precedent. She's a great lover of the law. And so I, I think part of it is she believes it needs to come from movements that agitate at the outside. It needs to come from political change. And then there is a role. That was the role that she chose for herself, for the law to push forward and make society more equal. And she's talked again and again about, you know, when I asked her, when I interviewed her for MSNBC, uh, you know, how would you like to be remembered when the time comes? And she said, somebody who used whatever talents I have to help repair the tears in the world. It's amazing, really powerful. And, and it, I wanna bring it back to, to Jillian and, and what you've done. And there's been a lot of interesting threads in each of your books, and we'll get to some of those similarities and common themes. But what you've done with your book is really tell these stories of these amazing women and these 10 different cases and really bring that to life. So can you share one or two examples of some of these heroic women who really brought Title VII to life and also impacted you know, the cultural change for women in the workplace? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, that's what's fun about being a lawyer is that it's really just about people's stories, even if you're um, representing corporations. Corporations are people, too, as we know. <laughs> um, but really, I mean, uh, all, of, all of these cases are just about people who had something happen to them that they decided they wanted to make right that didn't f sit well. Um, and I, I'll, I'll say just by way of sort of overview, I feel like the, the um, advancements for women that are summarized in these 10 cases kind of fall into three basic thematic areas. And we've sort of touched on them, frankly, a little bit already. Um, and the first is the issue of stereotypes and the notion that um, there are only certain jobs that are meant for women and for men, for that matter. Um, that women are not interested in certain kinds of work, that they're not physically capable of doing certain kinds of work, that they're supposed to look a certain way and act a certain way. Um, a second thread, um, also major, obviously, um, component of, of jurisprudence um, uh, around women in work is pregnancy and family. Um, what does equality look like when you have, as, as Erin was saying, this definite biological difference? What is equality? And then the third major development that, um, that is chronicled in two different cases in the book is uh, recognition of sexual harassment as sex discrimination, which you know, sexual harassment didn't even have a name in 1964. It was just accepted uh, as just the way things are. So that transformation to a world in which all of us have sat through at least one sexual harassment training probably in the last year um, uh, is, is an incredible transfer. Not that it's stamped it out, and let me give that caveat. The book is meant to be a celebration of how far we've come, but it is certainly not a, uh, not a, uh, a stop sign that you know, we've done everything we need to. So, um, but in answer to your specific question, Debbie, um, I think um, uh, one of the cases that really um, spoke to me specific, very um, deeply was the second case in the book, the Kim Rawlinson, um, and Brenda Meath case. Um, and it was, Brenda Meath and Kim Rawlinson were two women in Alabama in the early 1970s who both wanted to break into jobs that were historically held by men and still today are male dominated and it's still unusual um, to see women in these jobs. Um, Brenda Meath wanted to be a state trooper and Kim Rawlinson wanted to be a prison guard. Um, and they were both rather petite women and the state had um, for both jobs, I'll focus on Kim Rawlinson because for, um, 
for reasons that are that are too uh, geeky to go into here. Um, only hers is the case that made it to the Supreme Court. Um, so there was a rule that to be a uh, prison guard in Alabama, you had to be, um, I believe it was five foot three and 120 pounds. And she met the height requirement, but she was only 115 pounds. Um, I did ask her why she didn't just eat a lot of ice cream <laughs> to make up the extra five pounds. But she, once she heard about this arbitrary cutoff, and it was arbitrary, because it turned out Alabama had absolutely no basis for having set the cutoffs at those places. They just had decided bigger was better and 5'3 wasn't big enough and, or excuse me, 5'2 wasn't big enough and 5'3 was. Um, and so that was why she, um, she stuck with it rather than just trying to alter her weight. But the, um, I think the reason that her case resonated with me is that, you know, these women, today I have the benefit of Kim Rollinson's case on the books that said that height and weight requirements that can't be justified by business necessity, i.e. showing that the job is done better by someone who meets those neutral criteria. Um, you know, that principle is now enshrined for me in my work when a construction worker or a firefighter or a cop comes into my office um, who wants to challenge a, you know, a physical agility test, for example, to get into one of those jobs. Um, I have Kim Rollinson's case to rely on. Kim Rollinson didn't. Kim Rollinson had nothing. And um, I think, and she also was um, very much um, kind of a loner within her family. Um, and so that just, I, I try to put myself in the position of being a, you know, a recent college graduate, which is what she was, 21, 22, growing up in a family where everyone, she, she's white, and where everyone used the N-word, even though they'd grown up in, you know, she grew up in Montgomery where the bus boycott was going on. No one's consciousness had been raised. And everyone in her family was furious at her for bringing this case. Her parents had a, a business that they were worried, a real estate business they were worried was going to be damaged. They were worried about her being branded as not feminine and, you know, unmarriageable. Um, and so to have the law against you and also to feel like your family kind of doesn't understand you or understand why you're doing this thing, I think must have been a very, very lonely experience. Um, she ultimately very luckily hooked up with lawyers at the now famous but then fledgling Southern Poverty Law Center. It was just three lawyers at that time um, and certainly not renowned for its work on, on gender issues, more, more on, on race issues these days. Um, and she actually was working as the shampoo girl at the place where all of the lawyers got their hair cut. <laughs> and so lawyer uh, Pamela Horowitz uh, came in to get a haircut and she start, struck up a conversation with the woman shampooing her hair. And, Soon enough, Kim Rollinson was a client. Um, anyway, so I, I think that is, is one um, case that really got to me from a, from a personal perspective as well as the, the change that she affected. It really, uh, it's truly not an, an understatement to say anytime you see a woman in one of these you know, historically male-dominated jobs, she's a big reason that, that they're there. Um, and then I think also um, Michelle Vinson, who um, is an African-American woman who at age 19 started working at a bank branch um, in her home neighborhood of Northeast Washington, D.C. Um, first professional job she'd held and um, uh, really not a lot of family support. Another woman who was very much on her own. Her home life was so um, awful that she um, married a friend of the family, but she was too young to get married without her parents' permission unless she was pregnant. So she got pregnant so that she could leave the family home and move out. Um, and she eventually divorced from that, from that husband. But um, she, about six months into her tenure at this bank, um, began, um, well, on one pivotal night, got uh, an, an advance made towards her by her boss who took her to a motel and said, I made you and I can break you, uh, meaning that he had taken a chance on her. She had, she had worked in a plant store before she had gotten the job at the bank. And he said, I made you and I can break you and you're gonna have sex with me tonight. And she gave in and um, they continued. Um, she continued to give in over the next three years. Um, and um, at that time, sexual harassment, as I said, was only just starting, the name was just starting to be in the, in the, in the lexicon. And, but the cases that were recognized were the ones where a woman's wallet was impacted. In other words, supervisor makes a, an advance, woman rebuffs it, supervisor fires woman. So that's something that the courts started to understand. Okay, that, that sounds like discrimination. But where, uh, in a case like Michelle Vincent, although she was a horrible, um, I mean, what she was experiencing was criminal, not just uh, awful physical abuse uh, and emotional abuse, 
but her career didn't suffer. She kept her job. In fact, she was promoted to assistant manager. So what's the, what's the harm there? And she ultimately got a unanimous ruling from the Supreme Court that a hostile work environment is uh, discrimination because of sex. Um, and, uh, and that is a, a ruling that I think um, all of us in this room have benefited from regardless of whether we've ever been harassed or not. It's just a, to have the highest court set down a ruling um, about what is dignity in the workplace. And uh, again, um, Michelle Vinson was very much alone in trying to, in, literally in her life, and also in trying to make this new law. And uh, additionally, her behavior was very much put on trial in the trial of the case that she had, uh, testimony was introduced, she had worn low cut blouses and tight pants and talked about her sex life and her fantasies and so forth. And that was discussed even in the Supreme Court decision as being possibly relevant. Um, that changed with later cases. But so, to, to, I, again, putting myself in her shoes, to be totally alone, um, literally to be alone in trying to make this new theory of law stick, and then at the same time to be questioned about how you caused what happened to you um, was a very powerful um, story to write about. Um, and she, and one of the most important cases in the book, for sure. And really compelling and very sad story. I mean, really, you get into the characters to such a significant degree of depth that you really feel you know these people. Um, both of you have referenced the Civil Rights Act and sort of, you know, uh, that, that there's overlapping attorneys who deal with both Civil Rights Act issues relating to race as well as gender. And I just wonder if you could talk both about examples you have in the book of the parallels and how uh, some of the sort of ways that the women's movement has benefited and been informed by the civil rights movement more generally. Erin, Erin, will you start? Well, one of our favorite stories in the book is uh, RBG's friendship with Polly Murray. So I think one of the interesting things about having both race and sex in Title VII is, of course, everyone has a race and a sex. And you could be discriminated against on an axis that intersects uh, and, and there were conversations at the time, I think, even there were interviews from people given, um, and I think Polly Murray, actually, who was a, a, an ACLU board member and a civil rights attorney and had, had had a very varied career as a, a poet and an activist in the civil rights movement um, and later a theologian, she was arguing on behalf of keeping the sex provision in the Civil Rights Act or for the EEOC to interpret it uh, broadly, and she said, you know, I don't know if someone is discriminating against me because of my race or because of my gender. There were times that people would actually tell her <laughs> why she wasn't. Like when she, she was the highest scoring person in her Howard University Law School and that would have normally entitled her to a scholarship to Harvard Law School and they told her you're the wrong gender. Um, so she had, and that was about, she was about a half generation older than Justice Ginsburg. But the work that she did uh, throughout the 60s in developing theories of what would happen if the um, if the ERA was not ratified, if the Equal Rights Amendment did not become in force. And she suggested, uh, and she, she you know, did a lot of work on this, that the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause be a vehicle to ensure equality for women. And there was another woman at the ACLU, Dorothy Kenyon, who had also been a great activist, and they worked together on this. Um, and Polly Moore wrote a, a, a law review essay called Jane Crow and the Law, in which she really laid this out. And so when Justice Ginsburg then, you know, uh, ACLU Women's Rights Project co-director, when she was writing her first brief to the Supreme Court in Reed v. Reed, and it really is sort of the genesis of like all of the work that she would do in the Supreme Court, different seeds of it are inside this brief, which is full of really interesting references to social science and, uh, and, but on the very front page, so this is her chance, this is, she had been this kind of uh, quiet civil procedure attorney who then became somebody who went in front of the Supreme Court and challenged their deepest notions about gender. And in her chance to shine, she listed Polly Murray and Dorothy Kenyon as the co-authors of the brief, even though they actually hadn't worked on it, because it was really important for her to give credit to the people whose ideas on which she relied. And you know, so when she's compared to Thurgood Marshall, um, and said, they said that she was the Thurgood Marshall of the women's rights movement when she was nominated, she said, that's true, but my life was never in danger. So I think 
you know, it's no coincidence that, that this notorious RBG nickname happened the week that she was really dissenting in cases that involve remedies to racial discrimination. And I think that's one of the reasons that I think her feminism is still very relevant because she did think very deeply about this. And of course, from a legal standpoint, Title VII, uh, the Equal Protection, the 14th Amendment, these are all products of activism uh, on behalf of equality for African Americans in this country. And so from a very literal standpoint, they were building on the work of the civil rights movement. And I think she was very scrupulous and has been very scrupulous about giving credit when credit's due. And also speaking up in moments where essentially what Chief Justice Roberts was arguing in Shelby County is that we don't need these protections anymore because we've got a black president, you know, there's a black mayor in Philadelphia, Mississippi, so racism is basically dead, or, you know, we got this, we've moved on, our country has changed. And she was the one saying, that's not true. Um, and, and, and so I think her bearing witness on that issue and using her position of, of great power as one of the nine Supreme Court justices is very powerful. And Jillian, what would you add to that in terms of the perspective you brought from the book? Right. Um, well, I mean, the, the interplay between the civil rights movement and the legal theories that came out of it and then um, jurisprudence under Title VII is um, very similar in, in, in a lot of ways to the kind of tensions that RBG um, saw in her work trying to win heightened scrutiny for sex and to say it's the same as race, it shouldn't be treated as this other thing that's eh, not so bad. Um, but that same tension has been there with, um, with uh, Title VII. I will say that, that there have been some, especially in the book, there, there are some notable examples of the civil rights movement and, and race discrimination as the model helping give a way in to the justices to find um, what I would consider the right way. I mean, for instance, I was just talking about the Michelle Vinson case. It had never been um, disputed after passage of Title VII, that racial harassment was a kind of discrimination that was um, that was uh, viable under the law. You know, someone who has a noose hung over their desk or KKK carved into their desk or is called the N word, courts didn't have a hard time understanding. Yeah, that's a kind of discrimination, even if it doesn't hit your wallet. If the environment is poisoned, um, but with with sexual harassment, it was. There was all of this, you know, wringing hands. Well, this is a natural thing, um, and this is sometimes complementary to women, and and so, uh, you know, it's just it's just clumsy courting gone awry, and you can't blame a guy for trying. So it really complicated <laughs> that th that um, analysis. But ultimately, in the Supreme Court ruling in Ch Michelle Vincent's favor, um, they specific the court specifically alluded to that body of case law, saying it's no less. Um, uh, no less discriminatory to have to run a gauntlet of sexual animus or sexual um, abuse than it is to run a gauntlet of racial abuse. Um, another time, uh, going back in time actually to the very first pro case profiled in the book and actually mm -hmm. the very first Title VII case ever heard by the Supreme Court at all, it beat Griggs by one week, um, um, was Phillips versus Martin Marietta, which involved the case of a uh, Florida mother of seven um, who was working as a waitress um, and uh, went to try to get an assembly line job at the defense contractor Martin Marietta um, in Orlando, Florida, and was turned away because she had a daughter who was in preschool. And they had a rule, no women with preschool age children can be hired. <laughs> Men with preschool age children can be hired, but women with preschool age children can't be hired. And the company's interesting defense was, hey, listen, we don't discriminate against women. Most of our workforce is, is women. Um, they just don't have kids that young. And so we're not excluding, we're not discriminating against women. We're discriminating, or not discriminating, we're excluding a subset of women, women plus small children. So that there became the, the phrase you may have heard before, sex plus, as a, as a strain of potential discrimination. And, um, and Ida Phillips had a very hard time getting an attorney, um, and uh, the first attorney she went to um, told her, who was white, told, and she was white, I should have said that, um, uh, told her he didn't want to fool with it, in her words. Um, and then she thought, you know, who knows something about proving a discrimination case? I'll bet an African-American lawyer knows something about proving a discrimination case. So there was a, there happened to be a black lawyer running for judge in her town. Um, by this point, she'd moved to Jacksonville, and, 
um, she went to him about representing her, and he said, well, I'm too busy, but I've got this young lawyer named Reese Marshall who just was interning at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund in New York. Maybe he can help you. Um, Reese Marshall told me in turn that he had absolutely no idea that sex was in the 1964 <laughs> Civil Rights Act or in Title VII, and he kind of nodded politely during their meeting, and when she left, he had to go get the book and read it and say, oh, yeah, there, there it is. Sex is in there. Um, but he tried and tried to get support from national organizations, of which there were not that many at that time, but the ACLU, NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and he couldn't get any traction. But by the time it went to the Supreme Court, there had been a dissent at the Fifth Circuit level by a judge who said, listen, what's to stop employers to stop at women, you know, sex plus small children? What about women who are married or women who are left-handed? or women who are blonde haired. And for that matter, what about African Americans who are over five foot seven or African or, or Jews with, without a college degree? Um, so the, this lower court opinion, the, the judge had said, um, if sex plus stands, the act is dead. And so the NAACP Legal Defense Fund took the case before the Supreme Court because the light bulb did finally go on saying, wait a minute, the whole law for everybody um, is, is in jeopardy um, on basis of race, national origin, religion, and sex if this interpretation of the law stands. And moreover, they looked at their uh, at statistics and realized, wait a minute, women with small children who are in the workforce disproportionately are black women. So it was able to see that um, its interests were much more entwined with little Ida Phillips's than they ever imagined. Um, and that was obviously, and, they, and she won a victory as well um, before the court. Although the court was, so the court said it was an unfair distinction between men and women with children, and that couldn't stand. But they did send it back to the lower court for the company to be able to try to make out a case that mothers of ch small children were, in fact, empirically less reliable. <laughs> and that's the last thing I'll just mention here about the sex versus race piece is that um, there's something called the bona fide occupational qualification, or BFOQ. It's a loophole in Title VII, that an employer, if the employer can prove that a certain job only a man can do, or only a woman can do, then they are permitted to discriminate. Notably, there's no a BFOQ for race. So it's, there's this notion that sometimes it's going to be okay to distinguish between men and women, that kind of, and in a way that's not okay for race, that animates the, um, the law. I, actually, the one last thing I'll say, which does, I think, tie in with something Arun was talking about earlier, is um, not surprisingly, the effort to borrow um, race jurisprudence and bring it into feminist jurisprudence really foundered on the issue of pregnancy. And there was quite a split in the feminist movement, and one of the cases in the book really highlights it, but I would, I would um, posit that it sort of is, has always been there and it still remains under the surface. Um, that um, uh, that uh, this whole issue of same treatment, same, you know, treating women, pregnant women, the same um, as men, who's the same as a pregnant woman, and um, and so the so-called equality feminists have, er, including uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, have urged for um, finding analogous conditions. Everybody gets sick and needs time off at some point. You know, a lot of people uh, get cancer and need you know significant. Um, time off of work, analogize pregnancy to those things and don't just make it a sui generis, um, you know, thing of its own. And um, whereas other feminists say, you, it's not just like any other sickness. It's far more prevalent. It has its own distinct harms and distinct conditions and symptoms. And tr trying to treat it like something else is ignoring the true um, barrier that it poses. It comes with stereotypes and all sorts of things that people um, I mean, there's stereotypes against the disabled, but that someone with, with a plain old garden variety, you know, lower back strain who needs an accommodation on the job doesn't face. So um, the, trying to borrow from the world of race into the world of gender has, has had its victories and also continues to, to have its challenges. It's interesting because both of you have just in response to this question brought up feminism and I want to bring some of the current issues around feminism into the discussion because, and also uh, Erin with you being a member of the press, you see obviously in the media there's a lot of negative connotations around feminism and 
um, really whether feminists are relatable from the millennials' perspective. I know you're both, uh, you're, you're a millennial, I know that, I have to be careful, but. <laughs> right on the um, border, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the what, I, right, I, what I'm interested in is, are some of the lessons from RBG, as well as some of the heroines in, in Jillian's book, can they help to sort of unify women around these issues around feminism that have been really thorny issues for a lot of women? So I actually think we're in a feminist renaissance right now. Um, I think it, it's actually empirically shown, there was a Washington Post poll showing that millennials are more likely to identify as feminists than the generation that immediately preceded them. And then in turn, if you go back, so that would be roughly a generation X, and then right before that, boomers also have a very high identification relative uh, to, to other generations. And so I think our book is, in, in that spirit is part of that is, I think the, the enthusiasm around Justice Ginsburg is an incredible intergenerational moment. And we were very aware of that. There, uh, I think it's no coincidence, and uh, Shauna did not specifically plan this, but it's a very real thing that at the moment that Justice Ginsburg became, <coughs> excuse me, became the notorious RBG, she was being urged to retire. She was being told, you know, we've got a Democratic Senate, we've got a Democratic president, it's time for you to step aside. Now, I, I don't want to argue about whether she should have or not, but I think it very much felt to her as if she still had so much work to do, she's still as sharp as she ever was. We write in the book about how she can do 20 push-ups. Yes, she had cancer, but she is incredibly sharp. She completely has her wits about her, she remembers everything, and she's contributing uh, to the court at an incredibly high level as much as ever. So the larger dynamic of being told, you've had your turn, it's time for you to step away, I think was very familiar to a lot of women. I, you know, I'm sure you've had a lot of cases that in, in which age and gender intersect in a particular way. There was not such a pressure on Justice Breyer mm -hmm. to retire even though he's only a few years younger. And so I think when you take away the kind of gatekeepers of who is a hero, who is strong, it's very striking that so many young women, and not just that the people who created RBG memes, were inspired by Justice Ginsburg at the time that she was 80 and everyone told her, your moment is over. I think it's really resonant. And Shauna and I have been having this amazing experience of having people, men and women of all generations, talk to us about their own experiences uh, with discrimination in the workplace. You also heard lots of great James Madison stories. But um, <laughs> there is a, um, there's a, a moment of storytelling that happens, and, I, I, and I, I'm sure it's happening with your book too. People want to tell these kinds of stories, and so the notion that anybody, let alone young women, might be interested in these stories, I think is really exciting, and we're really thrilled to be part of that. So I, don't, I think that, that the, the popularity of the Notorious RBG is actually a testament to the fact that young people, especially young women, really want to have these conversations. I really want to talk about intersectionality and the internet and the unfinished business in the workplace. Uh, we obviously were waiting for an incredibly important Supreme Court case on abortion access and the future of what will happen to low-income people who need an abortion in red states. Um, so these issues are alive and kicking, and it's nice to have something kind of fun to celebrate in the middle of, you know, for me, reporting on gender, you're often, mm. you're often telling really bad stories and you can't flinch from them, they're very important. But I think it's also exciting to have somebody who, you know, is a human being, is, per is not perfect, no human being is, but who's a hero, who you're excited about. Right. Jillian? Um, well, I, you know, my heroines in my book are, are people you've never heard of, uh, or most people have never heard of, and so it's, it's hard for me to know how they are in particular resonating. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that they will, because I'm hopeful that, um, p picking up on what Erin said, I hope that everyone can see some bit of their own experience um, in, in what these women have gone through in one or more of them, because they really are fairly, I, I say this of course from the rather um, blinkered perspective of an employment lawyer, I have a different view of the workplace than other people. I see lots of unhappy people from, from their workplaces, but I think it's pretty universal, the feelings of powerlessness, the feelings of 
worry about um, finances, worry about family, worries about um, uh, you know being um, treated poorly for just who you are or what you look like. Um, uh, and I, I also think, and I am hopeful, that as younger readers become informed about what went before, whether it's through um, um, more accessible works like Erin's, um, or whether it's my book, or whether it's um, you know the Sisters-in-Law book um, by Linda Hirschman, or just so many other sources, Hillary Clinton's story, whatever that might be, um, to understand this history and then see their own place in it as part of a continuum. That it's not like those were the bad old, day, bad old days and now everything's fine, or those are the bad old days and now things are still terrible, but that there's a sense of, um, you know, the, the arc of justice does, um, just does continue um, and um, that they have a role to play in it. Um, I, I think that's, that's my, my hope. So we've obviously talked a lot about women, and I want to open it up to questions after one more, um, uh, questions from the audience after one more question I'll pose to you. But I am delighted to see so many men in attendance. I usually require my father to uh, attend all of my events <laughs> to sort of up the representation. Uh, my sons are in school, so I usually can't drag them. So I'm delighted to see a lot of men in the room. And I want to ask one more question before we open it up about where men belong in this conversation. I want to point to a quote from your book. Um, RBG firmly believed that for women to be equal, men had to be free. And a lot of your discussion in the book is around uh, RBG's relationship with Marty, her, her husband, and how supportive he has been, had been to her career. And so if you could each talk a little bit about the role of men and the importance of men in this discussion, and then we'll open up to questions. So start thinking about what you have in mind. Well, you know, I talked a little bit about the kinds of cases that she brought in the 1970s. Her favorite case being that widower case I mentioned, who, the man who wanted to be the primary caregiver to his son. So from a legal perspective, you see it carry through. And I think she was, you know, we write in the book about how she was very influenced by time she spent throughout the 60s in Sweden, where the prevailing notion of feminism was freeing men and women from gender stereotyping. Men, too. So part of it was just her vision of what the world could look like. And part of it, I think, is strategic. Men still control most things in the world. And so if you only uh, focus on women changing themselves, you can only go so far. Women can have these conversations all we want. But the fact is, around 50% of the world is men, and they disproportionately hold positions of power. So making them feel like the truth is that people are held back by gender roles. They do have something to gain in this, and they have to be partners in, uh, in the struggle. And I think one reason she was so optimistic about the capacity of men to be partners in this is her own marriage. Uh, so, so one of our great sadnesses is that we never got to meet Marty because he passed away in 2010. But he was a brilliant lawyer who said, when he was dying of cancer, that one of the greatest things that he had done in his life, or the greatest thing that he had done in his life, is to help Ruth be who she's become. And we publish in a book, in the book, we were very, very honored to be able to republish this, the letter that Marty wrote her as he was about to go to the hospital for his last days, uh, in which he, we have it in his handwriting, and then also the text, in which he talks about how much he loves her and also what a joy it's been to see her rise to the top of the legal profession. And he was her champion. He lobbied for her to be nominated to the DC Circuit and to the Supreme Court. And while very successful in his own right, he made sacrifices as she previously had. Now, of course, we don't even notice when women make sacrifices for the good of their family life. So in some ways, it's like he gets a blue ribbon because it's so rare. He was genuinely a wonderful person, but I think you know, part of it was that they took turns in their marriage. And for a couple that got married in the 1950s, this was not the usual mold. And I think given the fact that she was a young mother, she did have two children, she, she had the benefit of great economic privilege, which I think made it logistically easier. But just emotionally, spiritually, personally, in her life, she had an example of a marriage in which they were both human beings, and one person was not subordinate to the other. And she supported him when he had cancer, when they were in law school, 
She stayed up all night typing his papers, and she dropped out of Harvard and was able to transfer to Columbia in order to uh, follow him when he got a job here. And then, you know, people were shocked that he moved to D.C. when she was nominated to the D.C. Circuit. People were shocked that, that, that a man would make that kind of change in his life or that, that he saw her job as the more important one. And so people would tell us that they, you know, slightly younger men, lawyers would say, like, I would look up to Marty because there was no script on how to be an equal partner to someone. And so I think when she thinks about the possibility of men to be better, not just women to be to do the things that we've traditionally thought of as men's jobs, it's also about both of both men and women. If they're if they are men, if they are people who have heterosexual relationships, and by the way, I think it's also one reason why she was very open from the beginning to same-sex marriage, because if you don't see marriage as a hierarchical entity, and if you do see men as able to fulfill their full potential alongside women in a partnership, you know, it makes you very optimistic and it gives you sort of a less rigid and less hierarchical view of gender as a constant battle where one side always has to be on top. And I think that model in particular that's profiled in the book about this taking of turns is particularly inspiring for you know, the women lawyers in the room who have spouses and the male lawyers also who have spouses who are you know, working very high power jobs and there's two people they're trying to juggle and the idea of being able to have each of you have your time and sort of you know, pace it and stage it in some way is a really inspiring story. Jillian? Um, as Arin said, the reality is that men are disproportionately in charge and uh, speaking now as a plaintiff's employment attorney who has looked, you know, looked at where things can go wrong, it's always or almost always from the top that there's a tone set or um, rules created, written or unwritten, that create certain inequitable systems. Um, and so I think I would exhort when you talk about the message to men, use your privilege and use your leadership to lead by example. So things like, and you see this increasingly, especially in some of the newer fields like in tech, um, you know, companies doing pay audits, um, compensation audits, you know, creating more transparency in the workplace about who's getting paid what and why. Um, and if, it's, if there's a disparity, fixing it. You know, there's some very high profile examples of that happening. Um, same thing with sexual harassment. Don't just make it the, uh, you know, send everyone to the training and put their, you know, signature page in the file so that if you're sued, you can say, see, everybody went to the training. Create a culture that is respectful. It doesn't, you don't have to sap all the fun out of a workplace to make it respectful to everybody's identity. Um, and, uh, and, you know, to actually live zero tolerance in how you are when you're with guys alone in your office and when you're addressing you know the whole company in a meeting and then the, uh, the I think frankly the one of the biggest things and the, the biggest barrier remaining to women in the workplace today is still pregnancy and motherhood and a lot of that is not a legal issue it's a policy issue in the um, um, shameful lack of any paid leave in our country or lack of affordable childcare. Um, all of those things are stacked um, to, um, to make motherhood an, an incredibly expensive and um, economically precarious option. But also, as I think everyone in this room knows, it also comes freighted with stereotypes about commitment and um, fortitude and stamina and um, all of those good things. And what we need are men taking leave that's offered to them if they're lucky enough to work in offices that have um, un have paid leave or even take their be the one to take the FMLA unpaid leave. Um, and that is something actually that there, where there has been a legal component. Um, I'm, many of you may have heard of the case brought by um, CNN's Josh Levs. He's also written a book about it, um, his experience as well, where when he went to take paternity leave, he learned that he got two weeks under Time Warner's um, plan. And I don't remember what the it's more standard, like six to 10 for the, for the biological mother. And a lot of these companies that are, that are announcing these, uh, again, in the internet era, era but also financial services um, area, um, you know, the, are making these big announcements about their wonderful 
um, maternity leave plans, but the, the paternity leave still remain vastly um, inequitable. And so I, I put the um, burden on the people in charge who are setting those policies um, to make them equal. The EEOC has actually suggested that unequal policies beyond the period of physical disability for a woman who's given birth actually violate Title VII. Um, but aside from the legal, it helps. We, we need to, to, to de, I mean, for lack of a better term, de-ghettoize motherhood and you know you want to have things like yeah and destigmatize yeah. it. You wouldn't have things like mommy track and all those kinds of um, you know uh, uh, pejorative terms if it was something that parents just did and it was expected that parents would do it and men at the top doing it so that it doesn't appear shameful or in any way appear in any way send the message that your career is going to suffer. And it's also interesting, just work-life issues generally, that the more we move them away from just being parenting issues, the better off we'll be because everybody wants to live a life too. I mean, obviously, we're talking here about pregnancy. Correct, right. But when you have men and women availing themselves of work-life policies for reasons other than parenting, it right. really is helpful. And when we look at policies, we should also be looking at usage rates because usage rates is really the viability of these policies and really whether the environment is one that enables people to feel comfortable actually accessing them. So, so with that, I want to open it up to questions. I have more, of course, in my back, back pocket, but want to give you an opportunity. And we have at least one microphone, I know, floating around the room. So yes, thank you. Just raise a hand and, and say your name and where you're from, if you're comfortable with that. And let's go. Hi, I'm Sarika Arya, and I'm a summer associate at Sherman. And I have a question for Jillian, actually. You mentioned briefly that women of color are disproportionately impact by, impacted by sex discrimination. And I feel like we often hear that statistic, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the contours of what that means. Thanks. Sure. Um, well, one very noticeable um, or, or noteworthy areas in the area of pay discrimination. You know, there's that uh, April 12th is Equal Pay Day, uh, the time in a new year where women will have had to work to earn the full dollar that men earned back in the previous calendar year. Well, that's an average. For, for African American women, I think it lands somewhere in July or August. And for Latinas, it's, it's October. It's almost a whole full additional year. And, you know, reasons for the pay gap are, are for a whole other day, but I think a, a, a big reason for the pay gap, aside from straight up discrimination, which may be unconscious um, or may be conscious, but is um, sex segregation of the workforce. So women of color are still disproportionately clustered in jobs that are low wage, minimum wage, part time, um, and um, don't have the kinds of um, you know, what we talk about, work-life, you know, balance issues. I mean, balance isn't even part of the equation. If they don't have time, they don't qualify for the FMLA because their company's too small and they don't have any, you know, leave offered through their employer, they're going to lose their job if they get pregnant. So job loss then impacts the wages of that, of that group. So um, that's, that's a, a, a big issue. I think also, um, I, you know, I mentioned before with the Phillips v. Martin Marietta case and the issue of sex plus discrimination, that intersectionality that Arin was talking about, um, courts have been slow or, or mixed in their acknowledgement of it. And in the, the core of a lot of anti-discrimination cases when you bring a case is comparison. You know, the way, because so few employers now say, it's because you're a woman, you're not getting the promotion. They have some reason that sounds legitimate. Believe me, there are fields where they do say that. I represented construction workers for a long time and they'll go to get hired on a job and they'll say, no, we have our girl already, thanks. Mm. So some places it really is 1964 still. But, um, uh, but in any event, because it's, it's hard to prove a, a case, you have to do it through comparison. Well, how were people who are like me in every other way treated and a woman who kind of, I mean, for lack of a better term, has a lot of plus factors, right? Um, you know, she's a woman and she's African American, or she's a woman African American and Muslim. You know, she falls into a lot of boxes um, that it's hard for her to say which group she can be compared against. And it might be a workplace where, like Ida Phillips, white women are generally treated pretty well. And so then there's the additional burden of proving, well, it's not just my identity as a woman, it's my identity as an African American woman or South Asian woman or whatever. And um, some courts have been able to wrap their heads around that, that there can be distinct kinds of biases that 
Um, you can slice pretty finely, um, but, but others really want you to be able to put yourself in a little box and just one, you know, pick one. Um, so I think that's, that's another huge problem. And especially, um, lastly, I would say that because women of color tend to be clustered in low wage, low status jobs, that makes them more vulnerable to other kinds of harms like sexual harassment, for instance. Um, uh, and there might be the added uh, factor of um, their immigration status um, or language skills, their English profici proficiency, all of which can, can um, additional plus factors that can make them even more vulnerable. Um, and I'll just give a shout out to my former employer, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. They have really made harassment of vulnerable populations, which generally are um, immigrant women, but so sometimes immigrant men, um, but certainly a lot of them are women, especially in the agricultural fields, and have really focused a huge amount of effort on that population. Other questions? Yes, over here. So, um, in the context of Title VII, um, there was an article recently, I think there's been a book written about it, that the addition of those three words adding sex to Title VII was in fact supposed to be a poison pill that was designed to send the Civil Rights Act down in flames because nobody in fact had even organized, much less supported um, sex, you know, Equal gender equality in the law, and I wonder if you could comment on that, and uh, and in particular in the context of the early work that uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was doing at the ACLU, you know, building on the pieces, the the stories of the individual women are extraordinary, but the the sort of theoretical basis moving forward. Um, you know, in the context of the original intent, which was to bring it to a halt. I, I would love your comment on that. Um, I, I'll take it first. Um, I, I don't know if the books you're referring to are the ones by Clay Risen at the Times and Todd Purdom. They wrote two books about title, about the 64 Civil Rights Act that came out the year before mine, um, or in 2014. Um, I mean, I addressed this issue in my, in my introduction, so, um, it's a rather entertaining story. It was towards the end of debate. Um, Howard Smith, uh, a virulent segregationist from Virginia, um, announced that he wanted to add sex to the law. And um, it, it engendered a great uh, number of guffaws among the mostly men in attendance at the, on the House floor. Um, and uh, you know, people who were taking, at least pretending to take quite seriously uh, the rights of African Americans um, in the workplace thought it was pretty hilarious um, that women would be placed on the same par as, as men. Um, but, um, I, and I of course have heard the poison pill um, theory, which is that um, you know, legislators with the images of Bull Connor and Birmingham still in their heads, they might, had been, might have come around to, okay, I can support um, equal rights for African Americans, but oh my God, women too? No way, no, I'm out, you know? And so that's where the theory is on the poison pill. Actually, Howard Smith, believe it or not, was a longtime supporter of the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, he contained multitudes, apparently, and um, he was, uh, he had a close relationship with the National Women's Party since, since early in the 20th century, um, when they had started that, um, that movement after the 19th Amendment was passed. Um, and he had, um, had actually in his personal life supported a number of women in his family. Uh, the only negative letter to the editor I've received in response to the review of my book was that I, that Howard Smith got a raw deal, um, that, and it was one of his. He was only a white supremacist. That's right. Right. <laughs> That's right. That's, That's right. Yeah, but but ladies, he was, you know, <laughs> he was all so in nice to you. at least white ladies. Yes, yeah. uh, he was all in favor of. Yes. Um, so in any event, uh, so he had this sort of um, internal. Um, uh, dichotomy, and the final thing that I think is probably the most realistic, uh, and, and you know, and somewhat cynical, but he saw the writing on the wall that the Civil Rights Act was going to pass, and if it was going to pass, he wasn't going to let black women, by virtue of their race, enjoy more privilege in the workplace than white women. Um, and so, um, at the very least, uh, women had to be included. 
Um, and there was very vigorous floor debate actually by some of the women in the House, not many of them, but some, including Martha, Martha Griffiths um, from Michigan, who uh, really did say, uh, and all we have to go on is the floor debate, which isn't much, but did advocate about, you know, this isn't the era of couverture anymore. We need, you know, to, um, to change women's status in the workplace. But just one last thing to say, I, I, I have been thinking a lot about this original intent issue because of course now with the current battle over HB2 and trans, transgender coverage under the law and, uh, and L, LGB coverage under the law, there's a lot of talk about that we know exactly why sex was added to the law and it's simply not true. We don't know and more importantly, um, the EEOC which was charged with enforcing it didn't know, and in the first couple years of its existence, thought it was a joke, and publicly said so. So, um, uh, you know, even the most blatant discrimination between men and women, like having sex segregated want ads, it took the EEOC quite some time to decide that that was, you know, not going to be okay in the Title VII era. Erin, do you have anything to add on this? Well, we have in our timeline, we have one of the quotes from the white supremacist, one of the Dixiecrats, saying we couldn't possibly have the Negro have rights over white women. So there's a history in that too, you know. I mean, I focused on Justice Ginsburg's uh, sort of recognition and in relative intersectionality, but of course the ugly history of including among proponents of the ERA and women's suffrage did include sort of pitting against instead of seeing the intersections, the rights of white women and black people in general without recognition of the fact that black women were being doubly disadvantaged. And so kind of uh, capitalizing on the racism of uh, these mostly Southern legislators in power in order to secure right. rights for women, um, definitely one of the uglier moments of women's history. And you saw it also when, when black men were given the right to vote right. Um, and, and women of any color were not. So in, in terms of Title VII, you know, Justice Ginsburg's work at the ACLU, mostly the, the cases she brought herself mostly focused on uh, constitutional law. She did file a lot of amicus briefs in Title VII cases. She was involved in them, she consulted on them. But I think maybe her greatest contribution to Title VII has been through her dissent in the Lily Ledbetter case. Mm -hmm. um, and for, for those who are not familiar, I mean, I think maybe I should let you, you should tell oh, the no, Lily Ledbetter ahead. story. But, but the, I mean, she, she was working at the Goodyear Tire Plant for many years, being discriminated against in multiple axes. It's shot only her pay discrimination case made it to the Supreme Court, but she was also profoundly sexually harassed and assaulted. She was treated, she was denied promotions. One day she got a note in her uh, locker that told her anonymously how much she was being paid versus men who had started at the exact same time who were supervisors. And um, it was obviously significantly less and that's when she brought uh, Title VII and Equal Pay Act claims. And ultimately she was told at the 11th Circuit that she had waited too long to sue, even though she did not know actually, the, she didn't know she was being discriminated against until she got that note. But they said that the 180 day clock, tell me if I'm getting this, if any of this is, needs to be corrected, if this 180 day clock uh, with which one can sue, that it began when she was first denied the pay raise that created or when she was last denied the pay raise that created that disparity, um, as opposed to the argument that her uh, attorneys made and that Justice Ginsburg said was the correct interpretation, which is that each paycheck represented a discriminatory act. And so Justice Ginsburg's dissent in that case, uh, which was pre-notorious RBG, um, but was the kind of early stirrings of her as the great dissenter, basically call, without really saying that she herself had experienced this kind of discrimination, but she and Lily Ledbetter are members of the same generation, different backgrounds, different class and regional affiliation. But I think they both really felt an affinity. She really called the male justices to account uh, in their inability to understand the realities of women's lives in the workplace. How could you possibly know Without any, with, with, the fact is that most workplaces have no pay transparency. Yeah, anybody's lives in the workplace, right? Because this was this was the 180 day clock for any claim under Title VII. Right. Lily Ledbetter happened to bring a sex discrimination claim, but what they were saying is that anybody, male, you know, male, female, black, white, right, and and the couldn't wait who, too long. The people who would be subject to this kind of discrimination are not exactly in a position to come knocking on the boss's door and say, "Hey, did you deny me a promotion because of this?" Or, you know, or what is this other person being paid? It's the people who have the least capacity to right. press these kinds of claims, the least amount of leverage. And so um, there's actually a happy ending in that case. 
I mean, this, this is what counts for a happy ending uh, under the current uh, regime, but the, which is that eventually Congress passed the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, which enshrined into law Justice Ginsburg's reading of Title VII. Um, now obviously it's, it's an incremental change, but to her just the fact that the court and, the, and Congress could talk to each other and Congress could do something about it because that's what she said, the ball is in Congress's court and then it happened. I think she's somebody who really deeply believes in institutions and to her it was a great triumph. Um, and so when I interviewed her, she said maybe some, I asked her about it and she said maybe someday we'll have a Congress that works again. <laughs> Well, and if I could just add, piggyback on that, the, also I think the dissent in Vance in 2013 mm -hmm. is a similar. Um, that was the notorious RBG week. Right, right, right. So I'm sorry if, I, if you discuss that it. particular, but the same message of you all do not know what the work world mm -hmm. is like um, was in that case, which uh, I won't get into the weeds of it. It's a, it's a little bit um, wonky, but the, the bottom line is, is for purposes of liability for sexual harassment, defining who is a supervisor, because it's easier to attach liability to an employer for harassment that's um, perpetrated by a supervisor than by a coworker. And so plaintiffs and employees are very invested in being able to make that showing, well, it was my supervisor. But the court ended up saying that the, uh, the majority said, the only person who qualifies as a supervisor for those purposes is someone who has the power to hire and fire. Now, I mean, we all, or most of us probably, have our daily lives controlled by a number of other people in the workplace who don't have capacity to hire or fire us, but they're still a manager, they're still a supervisor, they're still someone who can make our lives pretty miserable if they want to. And this was another time where, where RBG read from the bench and was just really appalled about the being completely out of touch with the reality of most people's lives at work. Along, along those lines, I want to just come into this subject around women in leadership because there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, well, why is women, why are women, you know, why is it so important to have women in leadership? Mm -hmm. And I want to um, quote uh, from the book where uh, Erin says, um, she, RBG has been asked repeatedly about when will there be enough women on the court, and her response is simple, when there are nine. <laughs> and um, and I, I want to ask you, you know, Erin, this issue around the importance of women in leadership and understanding, you know, sort of what it's about, and she's, and, and you feature a lot of that discussion in the book. Right, and so it, it's not that any woman will necessarily advocate for women's rights, although Justice Ginsburg is in that category. I think it's, it's the fact that when she says when there are nine, we've so normalized that men are in charge that we didn't think it was strange when there were nine men on the court. So why should we think it's strange if there are nine qualified women on the court? Um, I, I do think that the women who are on the court right now are strong and passionate advocates for women's rights. You even hear it, you see it in oral argument. Um, and I think in particular though, it, it is something that can cross ideological or partisan lines. You know, I think about this case of Savannah Redding uh, who was, she brought a Fourth Amendment claim to the Supreme Court about the fact that, I want to say she was 13, she had been strip searched at school for having prescription drugs. Uh, for having, no, it was Tylenol. Yeah. Sorry, I'm a little fuzzy on this one. But during oral argument, the men of the court, including Justice Breyer, who usually votes with Justice Ginsburg, just found this hilarious. They thought that this was not such a big deal, not such a violation of privacy, made jokes about how, oh, in the locker rooms, people used to stick things in my pants. Justice Scalia made many inappropriate allusions. <laughs> and Justice Ginsburg took the unusual step of giving an interview uh, to USA Today before the case had even been publicly announced as resolved and saying that, oh, and so while she was on the bench, she lost it. She completely lost it. She just said, you have no, I'm trying to remember her exact words. She basically said, you have no idea what it was like to be a 13-year-old girl. This is much more invasive than you realize. This is a very pivotal time in a girl's life where her body is changing. And so for you to think that this is a moment for you to joke, I'm paraphrasing, it's really inappropriate. At that point, she was the only woman on the court because it was the period between Justice O'Connor retiring and the two female Obama appointees that joined in 2009 and 2010. So she, what the, she said in her interview was that she was reminded of these meetings in the 70s 
these are meetings among the left in which she would say something and no one would react and then a man would say something and everyone, it would be exactly the same thing she just said and they'd say, great idea. And she said that that was happening at the Supreme Court. And I thought that was such an amazing thing for her to say because we know who her colleagues are. Right. Um, and so even now, as a Supreme Court justice, her very presence in the room, reminding them that their experience is not necessarily the universal experience. That's the assumption, right? So each of the justices has a, a set of different experiences in their lives. But it just so happens that women experience the world uh, in a way that may be different from how men experience the world, how they're treated, what the stereotypes are, the expectations, uh, including what it's like to be a 13-year-old girl. And so for her just to be there and to say, wait a minute, you're missing something, I think was deeply important. I want to see if we, ha we have time for one very brief last question. I want to see if there's a hand up for that before we conclude. Okay. Um, I want to ask one final question then. Um, I know you include Erin in the back of the, towards the end of the book, um, sort of inspiration, lessons learned from RBG. And I, I'd like to hear from both of you just very briefly, what are some inspirational messages from your books that can be hopeful, that we can be hopeful about future change? Well, I, I think just this idea that, that people can arrive at the highest positions in our society and still advocate for marginalized people, still remember what it was like to be discriminated against, um, still use their voice in a powerful way. I think that's very inspirational. I think her spirit of collaboration and giving credit, her veneration for the Supreme Court, uh, those are all really powerful too. She, she's embraced a model that is working through the system to create change, but I think she's never apologized for being a feminist. She's never apologized for being a women's rights attorney. Uh, you know, Ron Klain recently commented on this, uh, that when he was preparing her for her Supreme Court confirmation hearings and he wrote this memo saying, you know, she only cares about her own integrity and her own dignity and she won't say anything bad about the ACLU and we're very worried about this. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I think she really is an inspirational model for somebody who is very much herself with so much integrity and yet who is willing to compromise, not on principles, but strategize about how to reach those more just, more equal ends so that we can all participate in society fully and not be held back on the basis of stereotypes or discrimination. So, so I, I think she just really is a role model of someone who models how to create a more just world through the talents that you have. And she always says, you know, when she's asked for advice for young women, she says, um, Fight for the things you care about, but do so in a way that will lead others to join you. And I think that lead others to join you is actually the relevant part, mm -hmm. because she is a fighter. But the paradox is that she demands a kind of deliberate, strategic way of doing things that will bring along men, that will see intersections in other realms of life. And I think that that challenges our notion of, of who's a revolutionary and who's making change. Excellent. Jillian? I'm definitely inspired by that. Um, <laughs> I, um, I, you know, I'll admit it's. I, we were thinking about being, about answering this question, and I had a hard time with it because, um, you know, the takeaway from my book I think is inspirational in that these are such ordinary women who did such ex made such extraordinary change for the rest of us. But it was a great personal cost. So I definitely can't say. Uh, as an inspirational takeaway, isn't litigation great? <laughs> um, because it's not. It's pretty much an awful experience for, for, the, for the participants and often for the lawyers too. But I guess um, my inspirational message is that um, change does happen and the change through the law, whoever is the unlucky um, one to bring the next Peggy Young case or the next Sheila White um, versus Burlington Northern case, um, that that does change the culture. And with changed culture comes greater acceptance of these principles and then that informs more growth. And I feel like what is happening now with um, acceptance of LGBT workers 
as um, being discriminated against because of sex. And again, that's probably another panel, whole panel discussion that we could have. But to me, it is the ultimate um, expansion of the law, in, of a law that has been constantly growing and expanding and never contracting, at least substantively. Lots of procedural hurdles, unfortunately, have, have been put in place. But in terms of what the meaning of sex discrimination is, um, it's now understood to be, I mean, it, it covered men from very early on, that you know, men have a sex too. You know, the issue of intersectionality has achieved um, recognition as actionable. Uh, the fact that pregnancy discrimination is a form of sex discrimination. The fact that sexual harassment, um, words that we didn't even have in 1964, is now recognized as sex, as sex discrimination. That same-sex sexual harassment is recognized as discrimination. And finally, I mean, the, the big case that, that is sort of the basis for all of the LGBT um, uh, litigation these days is the Price Waterhouse case where you had someone, I, which I think is frankly one of the most important cases ever in Title VII, especially in the book, um, where you had Ann Hopkins who should have who applied to be a partner at, at Price Waterhouse in the 80s, who was one of 88 candidates, the only woman, had the biggest book of business and was deferred and then ultimately not put up again, so effectively declined, because she, um, the partner's comments said that she was macho and needed a course at charm school and swore too much for a lady partner. And then she went to her, her champion at the firm and said, what can I do differently? And he said, why don't you try walking more femininely, talking more femininely, dressing more femininely, wearing makeup, wear your hair styled, and wear jewelry. And that stereotype, and the court said, saying that a woman is the wrong kind of woman is the same thing as saying we're not going to promote women at all. It's still sex discrimination. And I think that principle, that there's no right way to be a woman or a man for that reason, for that matter, has been built upon and grown and held over and over and over again, more in the trans, actually, realm, but starting in the LGB realm. Because what greater stereotype is there that a man is supposed to be in love with men and women's, women are supposed to love other, I mean, man is supposed to be in love with women and women are supposed to be in love with men. That's the greatest stereotype of all. And, and for me, it's just the most natural evolution. So I guess my, my uplifting message is we have lots of, lots of lots of thorny problems. Most of them are culturally ingrained and through our families and, and our society and they're very tough to uproot. But change does happen, uh, albeit, glacially sometimes. So I want to thank this amazing panel um, and just really appreciate all of your insights and wisdom. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, my, my parting message, um, Sandy, I have a parting message. You'll appreciate this one. I'm going to come back to James Madison High School now and just uh, we, we did a planning call and we promised not to talk politics, but this is just slightly one thing I'll reference, is that it happened to be that Bernie Sanders also went to James Madison High School. And he ran for president and he lost um, at James Madison. So if you see my father, Stanley Epstein, on the next presidential ticket, you may know why. <laughs> Um, I want to thank you all for listening and coming. I want to thank Sherman for hosting us. Just been an absolute pleasure working with all of you. I can't find all of you here, but I do want to name everyone. Um, Anna Brown, who really facilitated this whole event, was wonderful, as well as Sean Koopel, Evelyn Molina, Laura Thompson, and Harry Marks, and of course Donna for the generous introduction. So thank you so much to Sherman. And I am delighted to announce our next event is July 18th with Dan Harris. For those of you who don't know him, he's an ABC News anchor. He's on Good Morning America and Nightline. And he wrote a best-selling book called 10% Happier. And so it'll be a one-on-one -on -one interview with Dan about how to get 10% happier. So thank you, and I hope to see you July 18th. <laughs>